thanks so much for being here. Uh, we have a great program today on rebuilding California in the aftermath of natural disasters. Uh, and my wonderful colleague, Lois Takahashi, who is the Flournoy Professor of Government here at the USC Price School and runs the USC Sacramento Center, uh, will be our interlocutor today for a great panel. And so with no further ado, Lois, please take it away. Thank you so much, Richard, and thank you for everyone for being here today. And uh, welcome to this Lost Perspective sessions on home building after disasters. As Richard Green just mentioned, we'll be talking through with our very um, astute and uh, insightful panelists about not only what they've experienced, but possible pathways forward. I have to say, personally, I've been thinking a lot this week about tragedy, devastation, and possible ways to recover. So I'm really happy that we're having this conversation today. So for today's session, I'll be asking the panelists questions for about 40 minutes and we'll have our conversation and then we'll turn to audience questions. So please post your questions at any time uh, during the session in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of your questions as we can. So we are so fortunate to have our three panelists today uh, who again will share with us their experiences uh, concerning home building after disasters with a focus on wildfires. Um, their full bios will be included on the Lust Center webpage, but let me first briefly introduce them. So Dave Sanson is co-founder and CEO of DeNova Homes. Dave has over 30 years of experience in land acquisition, planning, finance, operations, and vertical construction. In 2014, he was inducted into the California Home Building Foundation Hall of Fame. Dave has recent experience in trying to rebuild housing in Santa Rosa after the Tubbs fire in 2017, and we'll be hearing more about that in a moment. Jeffrey Ross is Deputy Director for Financial Assistance and Federal Programs for the California State Office of Housing, excuse me, and Community Development, where he is responsible for all federal funds related to housing, including post-disaster. He's also a proud alum of USC Price. And finally, Dan Dunmoyer is CEO of the California Building Industry Association, which is the premier advocate for California's home builders and located in Sacramento. Among his notable positions, uh, Dan served as Deputy Chief of Staff and Cabinet Secretary for Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger from 2006 to 2008, and he's also a proud alum of USC Price. And I was just thinking this morning, uh, Dave, that we may have to recruit you into one of our degree programs so we can have a complete uh, <laughs> USC Price alumni panel here. Um, I'd like to start, though, with Dave, um, uh, Dave Sanson, as uh, someone who builds hundreds of homes after the Tubbs fire in 2017, which severely affected Santa Rosa, I know you tried really hard to help rebuild those communities, but you ran into many obstacles. Can you share with us a bit about that experience? You bet, uh, Lois and Richard, thank you very much uh, for having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to share my experiences and, and uh, collaborate with uh, Jeff and uh, and obviously uh, Dan and I have a long working relationship together. Dan and I work together at the uh, CBIA uh, in Sacramento, representing our industry for housing throughout the state of California. And uh, as as you indicated, I I do build a few homes every year, and um, we uh, tend to we do approximately a thousand units a year. And so because of that, between housing and, and home lot sales that we do, when the disaster occurred, a couple of the uh, local assemblymen and senators uh, reached out to me. We do build in um, Northern California as well as Southern California, have subdivisions in Petaluma, Petaluma Santa Rosa, Sonoma County, Napa and such. So which there's very few builders up there. Um, and so uh, they reached out to me and uh, we dropped everything to try to help. That's kind of the nature of our company and what my wife and I like to do. We, we've been together a long time building homes and trying to, to help the communities in which we develop. The, the, um, our, our efforts were really such that we were even willing to set aside some other projects because we didn't have the ability uh, in light of the tragedy to take on more uh, obligation. We were gonna set aside some of our other projects in the Bay Area to literally go to Santa Rosa to help with the rebuild effort. Um, I've actually lived through several of those fires myself, being an Napa resident my, um, and uh, having our entire ranch and, and uh, our, our, some of our outbuildings burned down. So I was very sympathetic to the process. Um, and, and frankly, I, I have dealt a lot with uh, tornadoes growing up in the Midwest and flooding and seeing, you know, the amazing action that, that FEMA can do. 
But uh, a local jurisdiction uh, like Sonoma County or even the state of California just doesn't have the resources needed to immediately step in with a major tragedy like this. And partly because it's new. Other than the Oakland fire that we had almost 30 years ago, which I helped to rebuild that early in my career, uh, which was very challenging, very difficult, uh, one house at a time. Uh, when Santa Rosa uh, burned, uh, they were school teachers and doctors and, and policemen and, and just really community citizens that needed our help quickly. There was no alternative housing. They were going to have to leave the area or the, a lot of the services and businesses were going to really suffer. And so the elected officials did everything they could to round up folks like our company to, to help. What ended up happening really was a can of worms because we just hadn't been experienced in, in all this. And when we jumped in there with the city who was very cooperative and the county and, and all the other agencies, every time we asked a question, more roadblocks came up whether it had to do with the environmental issues, rebuilding the underground infrastructure that melted and got destroyed that nobody anticipated, the above ground infrastructure with electricity and, and all those sorts of things. And who was gonna rebuild the roads? Who was gonna, who, if the roads were substandard by today's standards, but built 50 years ago, did we have to widen the roads? the list just kept going on and on. And to get these homes going on short order and in a mass production standpoint um, and not doing it one home at a time is what is ultimately ended up happening really became the issue for our company, which disallowed us from being able to help, even though the government agencies that were local wanted it to happen. Um, I think we've come a long way since the tub fire. I, I personally uh, witnessed the paradise fire as well. And, um, and FEMA really stepped in in a big way to do some of the initial hazardous cleanup almost immediately. My own neighborhood in Napa, which burned last year, we were the only surviving home out of 100 homes uh, within our community. And part of that was uh, I had worked with uh, one of the uh, state senators, Bill Dodd, who worked on some fire legislation. And so we decided on our property to test all the things that he wanted to try to put into this to help Californians keep insurance companies in California. And again, I'm very uh, proud and also sad to say I am the only one out of 100 homes that survived because we followed those guidelines that we recently put into place but didn't previously have. And that's what we need to keep light of. We can't stop building in homes in California where they have urban interface because there is no place else to build homes. We just need to be smarter and better about it. And we need to collaborate with the federal government, the state government and local governments to keep that going. But doing a large scale renovation of a project like that um, on a production basis is extremely prohibitive um, because of all those things. Um, and then secondarily, it was the insurance. It was every homeowner was insured by a different insurance company. So we couldn't go deal with one insurance carrier and say, we want to rebuild a hundred homes for all these people. And every one of them have a different process, different step. And so even as we got through the building process with all the engineering and public works and, and such, uh, then we had to go through another bureaucratic layer of process with the homeowners. And they got so frustrated after several months, they just moved away. And now we're back to that piecemeal development. So that's kind of a snapshot. Um, I'm happy to elaborate any more, Lois, but um, don't, don't want to go too far. Thank you, Dave. Um, and actually, there's a lot to unpack there, but I, Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Ross was actually in the same vicinity um, during the Tubbs fire, working in Sonoma County as executive director of the Communities Community Development Commission. Um, Jeff, uh, you know, we've heard a lot from Dave about what happened there at, at Tubbs and, and uh, post- uh, in the recovery period, home building, all the kinds of different issues that he ran into. From your perspective, as someone at the county level, now at the state level, what do you think worked well? What have you learned from all that? And um, how do you think things are changing to accommodate these sorts of, or to learn from these obstacles? Right, no, I appreciate that. And, and thanks for letting me join today. And Dave, uh, your experience is unfortunately what so many folks have had to deal with up and down the state dealing with fires. I think one of the key things that I want to emphasize is your point that 
this is new. Uh, FEMA and the federal government's very used to dealing with tornadoes and floods um, and fires. Unfortunately, you know, each year since 2017, we continue to get racked with fires and we're learning, but uh, it's been a real learning process for the federal government as well. And I think you, you said it very well that, you know, no one was used to dealing with the, the federal regulations, the way reimbursements work, the way that we were able to coordinate um, or try to coordinate with homeowners and, and getting things rebuilt. Um, so much of that had to go through a lens that was never designed for fires. And so the fact that key infrastructure is usually three feet or so below the, the surface. And uh, I want folks to realize how hot a fire is when it's melting that infrastructure three feet below ground. And when it's doing that in the center of 101, uh, because that, you know, those major things are, are going underneath the freeway and the fire is obviously not burning on the freeway, but again, it's kicking off that kind of heat and it's melting uh, laterally uh, underneath the freeway and, and stuff. And, and so we would have sites that on the surface and according to, to federal regulation, we're ready to rebuild and there was no way you could rebuild. And we had to, you know, communicate that to the federal government and that that's a slow process unfortunately and uh, i think you know we're starting to really make some inroads but i will tell you you know my two years uh in sonoma county following the fires working on these issues daily and then now uh, with my new role you know i'm still engaging on a on a constant basis uh really trying to make sure that we're identifying and understand how do you streamline and, and move things and Quite honestly, we're not moving things fast enough yet. I mean, we we are constantly trying to make sure that we, we daylight uh, where roadblocks and obstacles are. And part of this is also government having to restructure and organize ourselves in a way that we can be more responsive. Um, you know, it, we, we can, you know, we've all talked about this in different forums that we haven't been keeping up with home building in California for quite some time anyways. And, you know, to expect for us to be able to then turn around and rebuild post-disaster entire neighborhoods or cities, uh, as we've seen with, you know, large portions of Santa Rosa and unfortunately Paradise. Um, you know, it's, it is not, it is not, <laughs> you know, where we're at in terms of just our organization and our structure. And so that's one of the things that, you know, at the state level, we've been trying to, to make sure that we're doing that. In fact, that's partly why I'm in the position I'm in. You know, my division is brand new and we formed it a month, a little over a month ago uh, with, with me now uh, overseeing it in part because we need to be able to make sure that we've created the, the internal structures at the state level that that can be responsive and are giving the right types of oversight and, and attention to, to all these programs. So my division handles federal assistance, but what that means is we're responsible for all the disaster recovery, all the CARES Act, all these these new things that you see coming through the different rounds of stimulus when it comes to housing and homelessness. And, you know, uh, just a month and a half ago, the division didn't exist. A little over a year ago, what we call a branch didn't exist. So like all this was kind of intermuddled with, within other branches, other sections of departments, more scattershot. So we're getting more organized. And part of that is, is how we're learning. But again, we, we still have a ways to go. And that's really my charge is, is to make sure that we start to really streamline and, and be able to address these things so that we don't have these issues going forward where folks are trying to do the right thing, trying to be responsive, trying to get folks back uh, to some semblance of normal. I mean, fires and, and natural disasters are just traumatic anyways, but we don't need to be adding to that trauma by our inability to respond. Thank you, Jeff, for that. Um, we appreciate you uh, streamlining and heading this new office. Um, I'm sure it's there's a lot come, going on. Um, Dan, let me turn to you. You know, you have a lot of experience with insurance, with housing, with state agencies, with legislatures. I mean, what what do you take from all of this? And and I should tell our readers that our readers, our listeners, that one of the reasons that motivated this session was that Dan had talked to the New York Times about what were the challenges related to rebuilding after uh, fire, fire disasters like we've experienced? And, and uh, so can you tell us what you are thinking about all of this? And also if you've been hearing from your members, similar to what Dave's story has been about their challenges in rebuilding after disasters. 
Well, thanks, Lois, and thank you for this opportunity. Thanks for your leadership at the Sacramento Center and, and Richard Green, thank you too for your leadership down in Los Angeles. A few thoughts, I just wanna build on Dave's comments and just amplify them for our membership. Um, it is very difficult uh, post-disaster and having managed a number of hundreds of fires for Governor Schwarzenegger when I was there, you can walk into the devastation afterwards and it really is just a great tragedy. Um, to build on the comments of Dave, there's a couple of things that make it really difficult. One is um, it is the insurance mechanism and it's the community dy dynamics, those two together. I've only seen one truly successful rebuild in California and it was a Scripps fire when Governor Davis was governor. Um, and the reason why it was is two things happened. Uh, the communities came together. So a large component of the community came together and was willing to reach out to three or four developers like Dave and say, hey, you bid on our homes. You tell us what you're gonna build us. And instead of building 200 completely different homes, you can maybe build four or five different homes. We get to pick from those plans. And together we will then work with our insurance companies to give you a framework to move on that because each insurance company pays you something. Um, uh, but, you know, so at least you have a framework and a foundation. That's the only success story I've seen in the last 15, 18 years on the firefighting front. Today's point, if you have to go home by home, different plan, different insurance company, and even different coverage with the same insurance company, because you might have an agent who's more diligent in upgrading the policies and updating them so you have adequate coverage. You might have some, I haven't talked to my agent for a decade, who cares? Um, and so you find yourself having inadequate insurance coverage. So just if you can unite the community on the approach and unite the build, a builder or a collection of builders, because that's the other dynamic that Dave mentioned that other builders have. When you have a crew of labor, which is hard to find labor period, but if you say, I want you to build one home here, and then we're done here, we're gonna go like four miles to the right. And then I don't know what's gonna happen after that. I think I'll get another home versus, okay, there's 200 homes that burned down. And the framer goes from one home to the next home to the next home. And there's four or five plans um, and not 200 different plans. Um, that's where you can create that. And this sounds somewhat cookie cutter, but if you look at Coffee Park, it was cook cookie cutter. There weren't 200 different housing plans there. It was a community built by a developer decades ago. And so somebody like Dave San Sanson's caliber can come in and say, here, you know, here community, here are four or five models we've built in Livermore Concord we can do this here and we'd like to do this and you'll get a nicer, newer, up-to-date, energy efficient home and do so quicker, more effectively. And the crews, when they move like, oh, this is model B, they know what to do and they can move quickly and rebuild and rebuild at a better price point because that insurance dollar only goes so far. And the last thing I would say just in this whole context is getting communities to come together is really the hard part because as Dave said, everybody gets scattered and as Jeff mentioned too, there's this whole complexity of are we really ready for fires? So, you know, keep in mind the home of the mayors we saw in other fires doesn't exist anymore. The mayor doesn't even live in the city. So you have to find ways to create hubs, you know, whether it's portables or whatever, to bring people together, communities together, and unite in your approach to bringing the community back. Because if everybody scatters and there's no unity and there's no plan, it will take a long, long time to bring a community back. And that's the other part of the challenge. Thanks, Lois. So Dave, can I ask you a little bit about the Scripps um, rebuild and your experience there since Dan mentioned it? Do, do you- I don't think Dave was, that's a down in San Diego. So I don't believe Dave was oh, part of that bill. But um, <laughs> so no, I, I'd have to, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, that's right, that's right. Um, let me let me move to then Jeffrey Ross's um, uh, wheelhouse, which is all this money, uh, which uh, the spigot has opened again. So that's good news, but um, I'm sure it's co a confusing time. and. I wanted to ask you, Jeff, uh, what sorts of federal funding sources do you think are most important, especially for our audience today and thinking about home rebuilding post-disaster? Right, I, I, you know, and that too, you know, it's a patchwork. I think, uh, as Dave was saying, FEMA's getting better, right? Their, their, their ability to come in and help with the hazardous materials and, and things like that up front, which was a real quagmire, um, you know, for a while on the Tubbs fire and, and some of the fires. So that's obviously, you know, that immediate response aspect of the federal government and those dollars is critically important. We then get uh, what is more the longer term recovery dollars that come down the pipeline. 
and that's where we're trying to you know make sure that we are really organizing and streaming like stream lining ourselves more uh, effectively and efficiently. Um, but again, all these dollars are limited. And all of this is in context with insurance, right? Because we also need to make sure that we're accounting for what insurance is going to cover. And then we're trying to do this longer term recovery uh, in expend expenditure of dollars that is over and above and, and complements that insurance dollars, not duplicating, uh, you know, uh, payments and, and those types of things. And then there's also some of the settlement dollars. Uh, so obviously PG&E uh, has been in litigation. They are now starting to, to do settlements. And so we've got to, you know, we're, we've got to work through all these different funding sources, making sure that we're accounting for what they can use. So it gets a little complicated. It, it is still a little new in some of these, these uh, manners. And so the key part is, is that there's not necessarily enough money um, coming on the long-term response to cover everyone. So a lot of what we're doing is a lot of the funds that you know we're directly overseeing at HCD are really for those moderate and low-income folks, and it's also for a lot of the renters. So Coffee Park, uh, which uh, you know Dan mentioned in, in his portion, was an older uh, you know neighborhood in Santa Rosa, wonderful community, wonderful homes, but a lot of those homes are actually uh, rental. Uh, Reynolds. And when you're looking to have this stuff get built back, and especially at the price points in some of our communities, especially, uh, you know, home prices in general uh, in California, when those units are coming back, they're not necessarily going to come back online as rentals either. So one of the things that we uh, started to also account for is that our response needed to create some new multifamily and rental housing, um, you know, units, in addition to trying to support the single family that was uh, destroyed and needs to be rebuilt and rehabbed. Um, so also bifurcating our programs in that way. And so that's where we're able to also start to leverage a lot of other non-disaster uh, recovery, non-specific uh, you know, uh, specific funds for these, for these types of uh, buildings. So that way we can leverage and, and just be able to hopefully bring more to bear and help speed up that recovery. But a lot of this is fairly new. And one other piece is that we're also now starting to see disaster recovery tax credits so that you know so we're getting some additional resources there so you know uh, again it, it, it we're kind of evolving as we go um, and we're trying to speed up and streamline that as we go thank you jeff for that um and we know that this is an ever-changing terrain uh dave samson so when you were talking about having to navigate all these insurance companies local government, state government. I mean, how have you thought about or how has your team been able to deal with all these different sorts of financing issues? This renter issue is a really important one too. I mean, you're right, Jeff, about Coffee Park and lots of renters, lots of renters throughout the state, I'm sure in these single family, multifamily homes. So Dave, how, how did you handle all of that? And what sort of um, help would you have liked to have to navigate through all these complexities? Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a great question because uh, once we got through um, a lot of the uh, state and federal environmental and contamination and infrastructure issues, it really did roll back to the insurance versus the homeowners situation, and that's where it really got complex, uh, which was so challenging for us. We hired uh, a couple uh, uh, retired insurance adjusters and underwriters uh, on our staff as, as consultants to help us navigate through the various policies. We were asked to come in and try to build 200 homes at a time, as Dan indicated. It got so crazy at those neighborhood meetings because you had 200 different homeowners that all wanted a different house plan and they had different insurance policies. And so we tried to simplify it by saying, okay, these are the five plans that we're gonna build and you can pick and choose like Coffee Park did 50 years ago. And the, most of the folks were okay with that, but then the insurance companies weren't okay with that. And then we're negotiating with all these different insurance carriers and some had different coverage, some didn't have enough coverage. And then, um, you know, the, the, the whole thing kind of unwound from there. So then we started breaking it down into smaller groups. I brought more project managers in. We tried to break it up in groups of 50 and then try to get 75, 80% of each of those 50. So we could go in and build homes, as Dan indicated, next to each other and get the efficiencies 
to stretch some of the precious insurance dollars that did or didn't exist. And, um, you know, I come, I come to a lot of these types of meetings with Dan and, and I hate to just talk the whole time about problems and issues because it never helps to solve the problem. And since we have Jeff uh, here, the, the one thing is I reflect on how would I try to fix this? And certainly the city of Santa Rosa or city of paradise, any town USA can't take on the magnitude of this, nor can the county. The state to some level can, but the only one that can print money is the federal government. And so you really have to have a significant leader in this process. And probably the best solution that I've seen internationally in recent times was I was also asked to come to New Zealand uh, after the Christchurch uh, liquefaction issue with with the thousands of homes that got wiped out overnight there and same situation as Santa Rosa, no place for those residents to go. They were all, you know, working, thriving families. There was no housing and um, it took a little while, but that was a great learning lesson because the federal government stepped in, took over all the insurance policies. They had every homeowner sign over a waiver for their insurance and the government was going to step in do the emergency disaster relief repair uh, replacement alternative housing and they assign their insurance policies to the government and with time government can be made whole through the insurance but if it's an individual property owner and they're fighting with the insurance carrier and all the local jurisdictions they're outmatched and they're out resourced and and um, it's the bigger guy usually ends up winning and the homeowner suffers and so I think, Jeff, from a federal standpoint, for these large disaster uh, situations, uh, we should possibly look at taking that model and, and potentially advancing it further here in the United States, because it doesn't let the insurance companies off the hook, and it does help to facilitate by bringing everybody together. And they have rebuilt those neighborhoods there in record time and, and taking care of all the environmental mitigation and got the community and the economy up and running very quickly and efficiently because the government stepped in. I know that's easier said than done, but it is, it is a viable solution, uh, definitely for something uh, of the, the large scale magnitude we're dealing with here. Right, no, and I think that that's an important note because we are starting to see that in some cases, uh, Superstorm Sandy, some of the, the, the tidal surges, some of the things that happen on the East Coast or the Gulf Coast with, with storm surge, even flooding. Um, you know, there is strategic retreats. There is organized, uh, the government as, as a federal entity is coming in and buying up swaths of land, doing that. The challenge is, and I, I was having this conversation actually yesterday in a meeting, um, so this is, uh, you know, you're spot on, Dave, and I really do appreciate the, the, the point because, but I, I want to point out like a community like Paradise, a coffee park, um, you know, areas of Santa Barbara and Ventura that have burned, you know, things like that, um, or even Oakland, if we go back uh, to what it was, 89, 90 how, you know, what we've got to start to understand from Polish perspective policy perspective is how do we how do we help preserve community give folks the ability to make a choice on do they stay or do they go because of the trauma informed with a fire which is different than these other disasters um and how do we do that in a way that that kind of preserves the individual and the household and their needs and respects you know uh, some of their choices they might want to stay in the community but they want, might not want to stay in that location and uh, likewise, um, how do we make local governments whole uh, who need certain uh, you know, tax resources, their infrastructure has been aligned a certain way. I think the nuance and the challenge with fire, uh, more so than maybe some of our other uh, disasters, is that it really, it can kind of be like a tornado, but on a bigger scale, really hit different pockets of the community because the embers fly in the air and they, you know, it's not a linear attack by a fire. It, it really just spreads and, and does things that are, are different than what we see with other, other disaster points. And the way they impact the community is different physically. Um, and so I, I think with, uh, as Californians, we, we all know, like uh, New Zealand, that a, uh, an earthquake can happen 
And unless we're going to leave California, we're not going to leave earthquake zone, right? But it's a different thought also, uh, I think, with the fires. And, and so I don't think we've gotten there yet. I, I think you're right. The, the federal government and in, in insurance is a real issue in California right now. Getting insurance in the fire zones is a real challenge. So I think we're trying to grapple with this, but the reality is, is that um, this is different and it is very new in terms of the ways we've got to think about how do we mobilize the federal state apparatus? Because you're absolutely right, it is not fair and it, we should never expect local government cities or counties to be able to handle this on their own. Um, thanks for that, uh, Jeff and Dave. Uh, Dan, um, have you been hearing similar or different stories from your membership concerning sort of their experiences around all these issues? The challenge for us and the disappointing part for us is most of our members aren't as courageous as Dave is to even step into this sphere because of all these complexities and issues. And the last thing you want to do as a home builder is step into a community that's gone through a horrific tragedy and try to force a different approach or something that they may not be ready for yet, uh, the grieving process that Jeff talked about. And if there's loss of life, you usually don't want to move back into the home that burned down where your loved one was, was deceased and killed. Um, so it is being that flexible. So unless, you know, I go back to uniting the community, and I see a question from one of our colleagues today here is on how to unite that. It really does require really strong leadership, local, state, federal, because there's always and this is every present, this isn't partisan. Air Force One comes in, boom, it's a big event. Everything's beautiful. We're going to save this community. We're Americans. We fight hard. And then like for the next three years, it's crickets because the people on the ground have to actually put it together. Um, and so that's the challenge. And so for a builder to have the courage Dave had to step in and say, hey, I'm going to try to take all these raw emotions and complexities and try to rebuild unless the leadership of this, the community the state and the federal leadership and the local leadership, the people who live there come together in a united format, it's really hard to move quickly. I have seen it done before in the Midwest um, where communities will do that. I think part of it is if you don't move somewhat quickly, what I mean by that was within 24 months, the community pretty much changes radically post-disaster. There's two things happen. Insurance money runs out 24 months, this thing called additional living expense. So you pretty much, as Dave said, you got to pick up your family and move to, you know, if you're in Paradise, you move to Chico. If you're in Santa Rosa, you may have to move all the way down to Tracy because you got to find a home. And so, and then all of a sudden you're like, hey, we got the kids here. We're going to school here. Do we really want to move back up to Santa Rosa? And then you're like, you know, uh, Tracy's a pretty nice community. I'm going to stay here. That's not bad. It's just if you want this community to come back in a holistic way, it's bad. And if you're like, hey, forget about this. We're just going to scatter. Um, that's why moving with some dispatch and speed is essential. One thing that has changed on the insurance side that gives you that flexibility is most companies now, not all, but most will write you a pretty big check once you get to that point and you can hold on to it and rebuild, or you can just take it and leave and find another home somewhere else, you know, hundred miles away, 20 miles away, depending how big the fire is. Prices are high, but it usually if you combine contents, structure, additional living expense, you can get pretty close to the home you had. And so if you wait those two years to use your additional living expense and all the other expenses, because you have like two homes and two mortgages and all that, it gets really hard on the consumer. Even if you have the top rate coverages for like a Chubb insurer, or fireman's from these high end ones, it, they still run out of money. So I think that's why there's not this willingness for a builder to step in, unless that's put together to some degree. All you're doing is your likelihood of offending people is great unless that unity comes together. Uh, thanks, Dan. And Dan is referring to the question in the Q&A, so I'm going to read it to you, and maybe we can have some other um, responses from Dave and Jeff. So Maisha Tyler writes, unity is a great concept for planning for recovery after the pandemic, too. As devastating as this period has been, we're all going through the same thing together, which is actually unifying. What can communities nationwide and locally do to collaborate with public, private, and not-for-profits to A, build the necessary housing needed, and B, create equity and access for all. So maybe I'll start with Dave, because you know I, I don't know if people know, but Dave Sampson also runs a foundation. He's been a part of home building and housing um, sort of strategies for low income and uh, homeless people. So Dave, how do you, do you respond to Maisha's question about 
how, what can we do together? Yeah, the the unity and and rebuilding um, are um, it's sometimes it becomes an oxymoron when uh, when we work on um, uh, issues uh, of housing crisis in communities. A lot of times, my wife and I, through our foundation, will go to a town or will be contacted by an elected official and say, "Hey, can you help us? We you know we need some." Um, transitional housing or housing for, you know, those making, you know, 30% uh, of the median income, which they're not homeless and they don't qualify for affordable housing. And then we go to start to identify how to do it. And then we find out within that very community, they say, no, we don't want to hear, put it in the town next door. And so, and we've had that happen to us many, many times. And, and so we have to, as a society, get used to the idea that we have to create housing for everybody. You know, it just can't be for those that afford it. It can't just be rental. It can't just be one size fits all. And we have to have more compassion and empathy in our hearts to want to help our fellow community members at whatever level needs to be done. If we build a high-end home, it opens up a whole series of homes at different socioeconomic levels below it. And if we build affordable homes, those are members of our community that work in our community and provide the services that we desperately need. So at both ends of the spectrum, they're absolutely essential, but it's the public perception that I think and education that we really need to get through and that's part of what this pandemic has done with COVID. It's made everybody understand we're all equal. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are, or what you think you are. We're all susceptible to the same disease and the same negative outcome. And so it put us all on the same level. And we need to think about housing that way also. And I think we'll go a long way. And again, I think not to keep putting everything back on Jeff, but Local control is the problem because when when a mayor comes to us and says, we want this kind of housing, and then his other council members say, no, put it in the town next door, somebody has to step up and be responsible. And those local officials don't get reelected if they um, are doing something that may be in the community's best interest, but not in their voters or their supporters. So it takes a higher level of government to eliminate that process of local control from the standpoint of trying to create regional goals or statewide goals that then have the ability to be met. We can keep coming up with more ideas, but they have to be able to be implemented and you can't do that at a local level. So, uh, um, it, you know, it, it just falls back to the same issues over and over again that I've seen for decades. And it's not just, in California, I'm sitting in Montana, California today, dealing with government officials here on, on the same thing. I'm vacationing, but they're asking me the same questions. They have the same issues with housing here. They just don't have a homeless issue that we do in California because the weather's so bad, but it's it's everywhere. So that that's my two cents on unity. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I think that, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jeff. I was gonna say, no, I, I think that, you know, the community aspect uh, brings a lot of different pieces in. There is, there is the conversation, and I was a part of it at, at Sonoma County, where you know we're not at a point uh, yet in, in, in this uh, state uh, to tell people where they can or can't rebuild, right? But there, there is, there is the community conversation of these fires have happened historically before. They're just more intense. They're, they 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 move faster. They're hotter than what they were in the past. But the burn scars are the same burn scars that you can go back and see in history where these fires have happened. So that has raised the conversations locally as to, you know, should folks be building in those areas? And again, you know, we're not, we're not to that point on a public policy uh, level yet to quite say, but insurance is pushing that conversation. That is part of the insurance challenge in the moment. And that's part of the conversation that, that locals are having. So as the community aspect cannot be understated, I think that, that Dan and Dave have both rightfully said that that is an important piece, but it, it is it is not necessarily a cohesive community conversation. It, it gets really challenging, and, and that leads to public policy and decision-making. Now, one of the things that 
I was really glad to see that we were able to get resolution on very quickly that didn't exist before the Tubbs fire was uh, when, when the money was starting to come in on the federal level to help rebuild Santa Rosa, it was going to just all be single family homes. It wasn't about this equity component and housing for all. It was like build back what was there. And as a community, we, we advocated. I was on a lot of calls myself at the time with D.C. and stuff saying, like, look, again, there's there's renters. There's there's folks that, um, you know, the housing that we're going to build back is not going to be the housing they can afford to move into. And 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 so we need to be able to account for that. And, and the federal government did. They, they did change and allowed for us to be able to create that housing option. And the state's been able to put that uh that program into place. But to, to Dave's other point of, then there's the local control issue. We have started to deal with that as well. It's another conversation, but the home key program that I led before uh, taking on my current role, we built 6,000 units that are being occupied as of this month, right? In six months, um, you know, because a lot of that was pre-existing, but some of it was brand new. To, to mobilize and, and, and create ho- permanent housing that didn't exist and to do 6,000 units in that amount of time shows that if we work together as, as uh, state and locals and we talk about land use conformance and environmental streamlining and we address these issues on the front end, we can do a lot and we can do a lot quickly. Um, but we haven't mobilized yet on this particular uh, point on how to do that effectively. And, um, you know, Jeff Jeff doesn't represent everybody in the government, so <laughs> we don't want to put all the onus on him for everything. However, um, you know, there's a lot of debate about uh, local land use control, state preemption of local land use control. I mean, it is part of the sort of uh, discussion of the day. And actually, I want to turn to Dan Dunmoyer about this because um, I think uh, Dave and Jeff both mentioned, mentioned this uh, controversial idea, which is, should we be rebuilding homes in places that have been devastated by wildfires? And as Jeff pointed out, a lot of these places have been devastated before, and we know um, that these fires are not going to get uh, better. They're not going to get lessened. They're going to probably be as bad or worse. So it... Dan, what do you think about all this? I mean, we know there's talk going on in the legislature right now about this very issue. Uh, should we be rebuilding homes in these places? And if so, how do we do that safely? Yeah, it is the question of the day. Great, great question, Lois. A couple of thoughts on this. Um, let's look at California holistically, because these are, you know, we're talking fires here, um, but Jeff touched on the issue of earthquakes too. So there is not a safe place to build in the state of California. Let me restate that. There is not a perfectly or even somewhat safe place to build. Let's say we move everybody from the wildfire areas into the urban core and we build up. We look like parts of Malaysia. Do you know what that is? That's the largest location of earthquake faults in the state of California. You got Hayward, you got San Andreas and San Jacinto. And so, and by the way, if you look at the true fire maps of California, the greatest likelihood of loss of life from fires is after an earthquake, not in a forest. Nobody seems to remember that, but if you look at the James Lee Witt report under President Clinton, you look at the loss of life and property and damage to California, the impact of an earthquake is a factor of 50X of paradise, maybe 100X. You're talking 10,000 dead, you're talking 300 billion in infrastructure costs alone just for the government of California. We haven't talked about the human rebuild side. The Little Northridge earthquake, 633,000 homes impacted. How big was the biggest fire we've had? 20,000 homes. So I think part of this is we have to build smart no matter where we build, whether it's on the San Andreas Fault, whether it's on mudslides, landslides, flooding, and fire. Now we can build a fire smart. And when my friends say, Dan, you know, we shouldn't build here at all, I'm like, go back 100 years, Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego wildland urban interface. We've just paved over it. Um, all of California, except for parts of the desert will burn. And even this past year, we saw the Joshua tree burn for the first time ever. So I think part of it is planning properly. It's building properly. The good news is we have the most fire safe homes now in the world, um, thanks to the 2008 fire code changes. And even if you look at the recent Paradise Fire Home, we have four to five times greater survivability in a 2008 or later built home than a pre-2008 home. 
So with good codes and proper fire management, which in English means parks, where you place your roads, where you place your water systems, you can create a safety hedge around a fire prone area. You just have to plan it accordingly. And I do think post fire, if you take the time to think that through, you can rebuild these communities, you can do it effectively, and you can do it in a way that saves lives. Because if we have a really, really big earthquake, then all the policy is gonna shift. People are like, who was forcing everybody into these urban cores? Well, we did it for environmental reasons. Yeah, but everybody knew there were earthquake faults. This is California, we should have thought this through. And that's why we say plan where you build, plan for safety, plan for safety of property and life. And whether it's a mudslide, landslide, flood, earthquake, fire, you got to plan for it. Otherwise, you're going to have to build somewhere else. Last thing I'll say is the safe place in America to build is a small pocket of land in the center uh, of the panhandle of Oklahoma. And so I thought, well, what do they build there? Well, that's where we store our nuclear waste. So anyways, I mean, there really is not a safe place. I mean, there's somebody if 80 years ago figured out the safest place from tornado, hurricane, flood, fire, famine. And I didn't realize the U.S. government bought it, and that's where they put nuclear waste so that it doesn't get hurt. My point is there's not a lot of safe places in this country. We, especially in California, we just have to plan for it and plan smart for it. Dan, I, I would say that you're, you're exactly right. It, it's We can't wait to plan for it after the disaster, right? Because as you rightfully pointed out, we only have so much time before communities lost. And so I think that that's what we're trying to be able to figure out how to do appropriately, right? Is how do we, how do we begin to really plan, be intentional on what we're doing? So that way, unfortunately, when disaster does happen, because whether it's an earthquake, uh, you know, a, a landslide because of flooding, you know, what, you know, whatever it is beyond just fires, right? That we, we are, we're better prepared to get in there to move quickly, to allow folks to, to reposition their lives post-disaster in a way that is more resilient and better and, and um, adaptive to what we all know is true is that, as you pointed out, there's not a safe place in California. We love where we live. We love our communities. We just have to, over time, use this opportunity and hopefully be better prepared so that we can mobilize and respond to better than what we Thanks for that, Jeff. So Dave, um, you, you talked a little bit about your own house and how you use different tactics to make it more fire secure. So I'd love to hear more about that, but also as a home builder, would you try again to rebuild housing in these fire devastated areas? Cause we know it's gonna happen or it could be an earthquake or whatever else uh, happens. And if so, what would you need as a builder to make sure you don't experience the same obstacles as in Santa Rosa? We, we heard you say about federal government intervention, but first let's talk about your own house and then let's talk about what other things occur to you as necessary for rebuilding to occur in an efficient way and equitable way. You bet. I, um, I always love following Dan because uh, he, he has such a great way of explaining in simple terms a very complex issue. And his comment was really spot on with my experience personally and with my feelings as to how we could rebuild uh, safely and effectively in existing um, fire areas that were ravaged. And you would think, well, it's, is it history going to repeat itself? And, and And I think with my own personal experience, the answer is Probably not if done properly. And it was really interesting uh, on our ranch um, when I got uh, my home plans approved, the planning process wanted me to plant all these trees around my house to make it more obscure from uh, the, um, the visibility of the public. And uh, that was great for a while, but then the trees grow up and they grow next to the house and uh, just like every other house that we build. And then you have all this fuel, you have this beautiful landscape, but you have all this fuel around the house and uh, they don't want you to eliminate it. And so you're, you're really just asking for trouble. After the 2017 fire, when um, the state was uh, attacking this issue very diligently at the legislative level, I worked with uh, a couple of the assemblymen and senators, as I mentioned earlier, and, and I said to them, well, this, I have a, the perfect case study in order to do this. So I, I brought the CDF out to my house. We went through, they immediately recommended that I take out all the trees that the planning department had me put in. 
So we selectively thin those um, and the planning department, you know, was very disappointed, but the fire safety always rules, which was great. Um, you know, we did all the other just commonsensical things uh, with, with fuel management and building materials. Uh, you know, we use cement siding, um, concrete um, uh, around the house, a metal roof. And then we bolstered up the water fire sprinkler systems, which older homes historically don't have. And as, as Dan indicated, uh, since 2008, we put them in every new home. And lo and behold, four years later, fire comes through, the last fire in, in Napa County and, and um, uh, Sonoma County. Um, it just it just burned tens of thousands of acres went knocked out all my neighbors who didn't have the opportunity to do exactly what we did and cdf was actually taking water out of my tanks that i put in under part of this process for this new legislation that was put forth to help protect um, the rebuild or existing uh, fire interface communities and it worked so there was a lot of effort that was put in and a lot of study and it is actually a proven fact that it that it it is capable of being done. And so if we were to rebuild in those areas, many of my neighbors will not be because it's too taking them too long and they got jobs and they need to they have other lives and they have to move on. But if it's done properly, you can do it to protect the consumer at a much, much higher level than when the homes were historically built decades ago. And I can't think of another place to rebuild my neighbor's homes anywhere in the region that's gonna be any safer. The fuel is now gone, it's all burned. It needs to be cleaned up and that's it. The chances of a fire coming back through there again, you know, would be decades, but not if the fuel is managed properly. And, and I think that's the one thing in California from an environmental standpoint, we gotta, we gotta get over is trees are wonderful. Um, landscape is beautiful, but we need to also do it practically and sensibly and it can be managed so that we can be compatible together. So that's my personal take on it. Thank you, Dave. And, and for those of you who are looking at the chat box, uh, Richard Green has shared a map of hazards across the United States and California is almost entirely red. So, you know, there is no place to build that safe, uh, relatively. I think there are a couple of blue pockets, but not very many. Um, yeah, I, I, I had to say when, when Dan said what he said, I thought, okay, it can't really be that bad. So I, <laughs> I do what I do. And, there, and Dan, you were talking about spot on. It's also the only example I can think of where California is a solidly red state. <laughs> I'm sorry, Richard always oh. wrote things in that completely makes me pivot somewhere else. But anyway, to get back to what we were talking about, thank you, Richard, for that map, because uh, it's always good to have evidence for what we say on these LUS seminar, LUSC uh, perspectives. Um, we're coming up uh, close to the uh, top of the hour here. So I'd like to hear, I'll go round through again. What is the one or two most important takeaways that you want our audience to hear about housing, rebuilding, uh, fires, hazards, whatever it is you want to talk about. So let me let me start with Dave Sanson. Oh boy, you put me on the spot. Well, I think I've, I've uh, Lois, you've given me the opportunity to pretty much share my personal experiences and thoughts, both, uh, you know, with my own home and fire and protection and, and uh, trying to rebuild uh, fire ravaged communities. And it, it is a public private partnership. And with these disasters, uh, the third leg of the stool really is how do you manage the insurance and the rebuild process? And so I think if we can focus on uh, using common sense and, and level heads to put all three of those together uh, in a proactive way, when the next emergency happens, we're gonna get better and better. As Jeff said, I, I've seen huge improvements since the 2015 fire just up the road from Santa Rosa in Middletown, which was one of the first large fires, 2,500 homes and many of my friends and, and such uh, lost their homes there. So we're making progress, but we still have a long way to go. And I think it just is gonna take a lot of cooperation and collaboration from all levels of government and the private sector, and we can overcome these, these challenges. Thank you, Dave. Jeff, you know, we are so glad you're in this new <laughs> department <laughs> that you are leading, which I'm sure feels like you're drinking out of a fire hose, but what sorts of uh, takeaways would you leave with our, our audience? Yeah, no, I, I 
I, I love this conversation. I, I think a couple of things is, you know, I, it, it's critical that we continue to progress from reacting to being proactive, right? Uh, to really get try to, to think through it. Dave's uh, story about his home, I think it just it, it epitomizes where we want to get to um, and how to figure out how to do this in a way that does create housing for all. Because I, I think that if we can get there, we're, we're in a great spot and, and, and we can we can comfortably live in, in the red state <laughs> that, uh, that the map shows. But the other part is, is to be able to do this in a way where we are – through the public-private partnership, we're preserving personal choice for folks that have gone through this uh, this unfortunate, uh, you know, traumatic event. And unfortunately, public policy in some ways is very restrictive to that personal choice, and we've got to be able to address that in a way that supports community but supports the individual. And so I think that it's it's not only the physical rebuilding, but it's the rebuilding of, of, of that individual and that community that we also have to be very focused on. And that too is going to take some more time. So those are all aspects that I know that I'm, I'm trying to be focused on. I love this conversation because it reminds me of, of where we still need to get to and, and it continues to, to kind of make that push happen. And so I, I'm just really appreciative of it. And that's really kind of what I'm, I'm focused on and what I'm taking from all these conversations. Thank you, Jeff. And Dan Dunmoyer, what's your big takeaways from all of this? Well, thanks, Lois. Thank you again for this opportunity. Appreciate it, Professor Green, too. I just want to build on both Jeff and Dave's comments. So one, leadership matters. Um, and the fact that Governor Newsom has stepped up to put Jeff in this leadership role at HCD is a really positive statement. Because if you do plan ahead, it's a lot easier if you walk into a community with general ideas of what has worked. Because, you know, you're a mayor from small community, unless it's, you know, San Francisco or LA, you're probably part-time, you're probably volunteering, you're probably like a hairdresser or selling insurance or whatever. You're, you're not a disaster recovery expert like Jeff is. And so bringing in expertise is helpful. It does require a community to come together, local and state and federal, and use these resources and, and be able to help the community understand that it ha does have an opportunity to restore itself and rebuild itself and do so effectively. I think the other piece of this is planning ahead of time. I just want to build on that. As Dave has done and Dave has personally shown, when you plan ahead of time, not only can you save Dave some, you can save Dave's entire community if the community comes together. And this is hard. I mean, I was involved in the Oakland Hills fire post-disaster insurance issues. It was the first big fire in a city, a major American city since Chicago in the 1860s. So we didn't know what to do. It was a mess. The, the great part about it is the community came together. The bad part about it is they all wanted to build their own homes their own way and could care less about each other because they all had special homes. Um, and the saddest part about it was five years after we went through all that, the community didn't clear out its brush. It's, it's surrounded by eucalyptus. Eucalyptus has oil in it. It's a fuel for fire. And we used to go back every year and try to help the community have a community cleanup day. And after a while, I was like, yeah, we're done with this. We don't want to do that because you're messing up the way our place looks. So the Oakland Hills is actually set to burn today, even though it could be very easily managed to not have all that underbrush, all that growth. It takes the community to come together and create a fire safe community. And it has been done. It's been done in Southern California. There's a number of places that the entire community comes together in a fire safe council with the leadership of the local fire departments, leadership of local electeds and leadership of the community. And they get together and they clean up their community collectively. So as Jeff's point where you have these massive fuel, massive fire, massive temperature, when you clear that out, you can protect it, you can defend it, you can stop it and there's no fuel. And the fire heat is very minimal. And the embers that Jeff talked about don't get sent a quarter mile down the road, that stops. So together as a community ahead of time, Planning will change the face of California in a very positive way. And it's a great way to bring a community together on something that's not political. <laughs> it's not left versus right. It's the community for the community. And that's what we need more in so many ways. So thanks, Lois, for this opportunity. Appreciate it. You know, we're at the end of this conversation. And as all conversations go with people like you who know so much and have so much great experience and insights, I, I could keep talking for a long time 
well, maybe five more minutes, but I, we're at the end of our time. So I wanna thank you all so much. This was such an engaging conversation. I hope we continue to keep talking about these things because Jeff, he needs some help up there. So, you know, we'll keep talking with Jeff and making sure that we get information flowing across the nonprofit, public and, and private sectors because that's the way we're gonna solve this problem. Um, I learned a lot today. I'm sure our audience did as well. I also wanna encourage you all to go to the Less Perspectives webpage to watch other seminars. There are, is a huge amount of expertise and insights on that page. All the, all the uh, podcasts and webinars have been extremely informative. So please go to that. Thank you for attending everybody. We really appreciate you uh, being with us today and hope you have a wonderful day and week. Thanks so much.